Okay. Um. Yeah. Let's get started. Um. All right. So welcome to lecture two. Um. Today we're going to talk about on policy RL methods, largely policy gradient centered. Um. And yeah, I guess there's a bunch of different experiences, le experience levels in the class. So we'll cover some basics and some more advanced things. And um. And there's a lot in the lecture, so we might not finish everything, but we'll cover whatever we missed in the next. So anytime anything's not clear, just stop me, ask a question. Yeah. Right. So last time we talked about how we're going to cover uh, these three sub pieces in the class, right? algorithms, supervision, and efficient transfer. And today we're going to focus on algorithms, especially on policy methods, right? So the first little piece up there. Cool. So like we talked about last time, the objective, <laughs> objective we're going to think about is uh, maximizing the sum of rewards when your trajectory is sampled under your policy. And the goal is to learn the parameters of your policy so that you maximize your sum of rewards. Right? And the assumptions here are that your rewards are digits, right? So you want to maximize your sum of rewards, not your product or some other. Um, you assume that you can sample from the dynamics function, right? So you can take samples in the environment, but you don't know its functional form, you don't know its gradient and so on. And you assume that the rewards are provided instantaneously when you visit a state, but you don't know its functional form, anything like that. So you, you get a reward signal, but you don't exactly know the reward. That can be something that's non differentiable it can be something that's, you know, human in the loop, it can be anything, right? So at least for the purpose of this lecture, that's the assumption for them, right? Um, make sense? Right. So when we think about this objective, um, the question is how do we optimize it, right? So the most obvious answer is gradient descent, right? You just take the objective and maximize it. Then you have methods which do dynamic programming, which we'll cover in the next lecture. And then there's methods that do model-based optimization, so that form a surrogate of your dynamic uh, dynamics function, and then try to optimize it against that set. Right? Um, so this we're going to cover in the next lecture, dynamic programming, and the one after that will cover model-based optimization. So each of the me methods has its own pluses and minuses. We'll discuss them briefly. Uh, but today we're going to focus on the first class of methods on gradient. Okay. Right, so here's a rough outline of what we're going to cover. Um, we're going to start with you know vanilla policy gradient, like reinforced standard method for policy gradient. Um, talk a little bit about their introduction. Then we're going to touch on natural policy gradient um, and try to derive that. And then we're going to go to more practical methods like trust region policy optimization um, and some variance on that. And, and then lastly, we'll cover proximal policy optimization or PPO. And then we'll talk about where it's useful and tricks and so on, right? Make sense? Okay, so how many, how many of us have seen policy gradient already? Yeah, 50%. Okay. Um, so we'll go through that um, reasonably slowly. Those of you who've seen it, I'm sorry, zone out and zone back in in like 10 minutes. Um, okay. So the objective here is that you want to maximize your sum of rewards under your uh, trajectory sample from your policy. Right? So let's denote the distribution of trajectories under your policy by theta at P theta tau, right? And your sum of rewards in your trajectory as R of tau, right? So then you can write your expectation under your trajectory distribution as the integral of p theta tau R tau d tau, right? It just it's just expanding what an expectation. Is. Um, right now, if you try to take the gradient of this, why is this any different than just supervised learning? Well, um, if you look at supervised learning, the thing that you're taking the gradient with respect to is the integral and you look here, it's the thing that you're taking the expectation with respect to is the thing you're taking the derivative with, with respect to together. So um, one of them, you can pass the gradient all the way through. Um, and the other one, it's a little more dicey, right? And so that's why it's a little different than just standard uh, supervised learning. Make sense? Okay, so let's, let's try and work out um, what it looks like. Yeah, okay, so if you look at your integral, p theta tau, r tau, d tau. And what you want to compute is the gradient of this with respect to theta, right? So you have the gradient with respect to theta of your integral, right? 
And under some conditions on smoothness and continuity and boundedness, you can move the gradient inside the integral. Right? So now you have the integral, the gradient respect of p theta tau, r tau d tau, right? Those don't depend on theta. Right? So you get this thing. This is not something that you can compute with samples yet. So we need to massage it a bit to get it into a more amenable form. Right. So what we'll do here is we'll do this little trick where we multiply and divide by p theta tau. Right. So you've multiplied and divided by p theta tau. And then you notice that you can group together graph theta p theta tau divided by p theta tau and write it as graph theta log p theta tau, right? Just by chain rule. So you're, you're saying, okay, you take one of the p theta tau's out, and then you factor the other two and write it as graph theta log p theta tau r tau. Right? The nice thing about this is that it looks like an expectation again. It's just an expectation of a different thing. So um, now you can write this as the expectation under p theta tau of grad theta log p theta tau times r tau, right? So it's back to something that you can compute with samples. You can use Monte Carlo. You could use more practical estimation methods, right? So all we did is this trick of multiplying and dividing by p theta. Does that make sense? That's what we call the reinforced trick. There's a nice paper that talks about it from a long time ago. Um, but yeah, that's that's the main trick in policy grade. That's it, right? Any questions? No. Okay. So let's try and like break this term down into things, terms, or uh, entities that we know about. Right? So if you look at p theta tau, you can write it as the likelihood of your initial state times the likelihood of your action a zero at s zero times the likelihood of transitioning to s one given s zero a zero under your dynamics function, right? So you can take the likelihood of an entire trajectory and break it down into the likelihoods of each of the individual components multiplied together. Right? Because of the Markov property, you don't have to worry about the whole history. You just say, you take the initial state distribution, you multiply it times the dynamics of the first step and the policy likelihood of the first step, and you repeat this throughout the whole trajectory. Right? And so this just gives you the likelihood that a trajectory is sampled under your dynamics P and under your policy pi. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So if you now look at um, the previous, let's try and re-express the previous thing in terms of these entities. Right? If you look at log p theta tau, you can write it as the sum of these terms, log p s naught, plus the sum of log of the dynamics terms, plus sum of log of the policy terms. Right? And then when you try to hit that with the gradient with respect to theta, what's interesting is that these terms just don't matter, right? Because p of s naught doesn't depend on theta. P of ST plus one given STAT doesn't depend on theta, right? So those go away. And so the only term that's remaining is the sum of grad theta log pi AT given ST, because that's the only term that depends on theta. Make sense? And that's why you call it model free, because you've, you've removed the model, right? You don't actually need to know what the form of these models, the model is. You're just saying that they um, cancel out, right? So if you, um, look at your overall term now, your grad theta log p theta tau just becomes the sum of grad theta log pi theta without any dynamics or initial state distribution terms. Right? Okay. So if you go look at your, um, your gradient, now you can rewrite it as just the sum of grad theta log p theta tau or p, p theta at given st times the sum of reward r of st at from zero to t, right? And so, not that this notation is a little confusing, but inside every term of t, you have to multiply the whole sum of rewards, right? And so you sum up over all the time steps, you take the grad log of pi, and then you sum up the rewards in the whole trajectory, right? And when you uh, try to estimate this expectation with samples, right, you can use a, 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 a term that looks something like this. So you take one over n times the sum over n different samples, and then you just take the term inside here. They're so going to sum up from t equals zero to t, grad, grad log pi times the sum of rewards. Okay. So that's your policy grant estimator, the thing that you can apply on a real robot or anything. Does that make sense? Any question? No? Okay. So what does this what does this mean, right? What does it intuitively mean? 
Um, when you look at this, all it's saying is that you're trying to increase the likelihood of actions in those trajectories which have high return or high sum of rewards. And you're trying to decrease the likelihood of trajectories that have low, um, low sum of rewards, right? So you're trying to say, let's sample a bunch of trajectories. Let's increase the likelihood of those things that have the high sum of R terms and decrease the likelihood of those things that have high negative sum of R, right? So you're just trying to upweight and downweight things amongst things you sample. So you sample a bunch of stuff, you increase the likelihood of the good stuff, decrease the likelihood of the bad stuff. Right? Makes a lot of intuitive sense. Right? So if you have these three trajectories, you're going to increase the likelihood of all the actions at the states that are taken along this trajectory and decrease it a little bit here or increase it less here and decrease it a little bit. Right? And so intuitively, it just says try some stuff and do the good stuff more and do the less good stuff less and do the bad stuff even less. Right? Does that make sense intuitively? And the difference with supervised learning is that you're actually sampling these trajectories that are not just showing up for you. Right? Right, so the resulting algorithm that you have is that you're going to collect a bunch of data, right? You're going to form that estimator that we just talked about, and then you're going to update the parameters using that estimator, using gradient descent. You're going to collect some more data, reform your estimator, and repeat, right? Uh, but the important bit is that you're going to reform your estimator only using the data from your latest set of data collection, right? Which is what's going to make your algorithm on policy. As compared to something that uses all of your history of data from previous, from previous iterations, you're only going to use your latest set of data because that's the only thing that comes from your current data. Right. And that's going to be a bad thing. We'll talk about how to fix it. Um, but yeah, this is how your algorithm works. Super easy. Sample a bunch of stuff. Construct this estimator. That's your gradient. Add it to the data. Learning grid. And repeat. Right? Does that make sense? Does everyone feel confident that they can implement it? Yes? I'll, I'll assign a homework. I don't know. <laughs> so if you have any questions, do ask me. OK. Yes. I might be a little confused, but is tau the path? Yes. So tau is a trajectory of states, actions, rewards. So when you sample things in sequence, you're going to have states, actions, rewards, states, actions, rewards, states, actions, rewards. So tau is your, it's just like a notation for an entire sequence of states, actions, rewards. In, in the first slide, you said uh, sample a trajectory from a policy, right? Yes, yeah, using a policy. A so, single policy can have multiple trajectories. Right, because it's a stochastic policy, right? So you can sample from it, and then your environment is stochastic too, potentially. And so when you sample from your environment and your policy, you can get different trajectories. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Uh, data is supposed to be the parameters of the policy. There's some like for including what you want to see. Yes. So theta is like your parameters of your neural net or your linear parameters in a linear policy or the values of your table in a tabular policy. So anything that parameterizes your policy. Can you go back up the slide? So uh, are we sampling n different trajectories from the same policy now? Yes, yes. Okay. So you like sample from your initial state and then you sample from your mm -hmm. policy and your environment and different types. And so you may get different outcomes because you're sampling different actions and your environment might be stochastic. Yes. Um, so, the, the graph, I know it's like hacking stuff, cool, but uh -huh. like um, you're shifting your distribution over and like increasing the likelihood of picking those actions. Are those actions like picked because they maximize reward? Yes. Uh, or they're along the paths which have high reward. Okay. So it's not a one step thing. You're looking at things which are maximizing the sum of rewards in the whole trajectory. Okay. And that's what makes it tricky because you don't know which of the actions were good and which of the actions were just like, okay, but we're on a reasonable path. Right? And this is some agent at the end that basically is waiting the like gradient as if for the voice. So if the reward of the path is big, then like you really got like the voice of the gradient. And so this is a good thing. And if it's yes. negative, you probably stay away from that. Yes, yes exactly. How do we decide capital D? Oh, uh, usually it's either chosen in your problem statement, um, or your environment. You define it as a algorithm design. Okay, it's yeah. outside the bounds. Yeah. Is this a completely greedy approach? Greedy approach, like only taking actions with 
Well, it's not directly saying choose the actions which give you choose the actions which have the highest reward. Choose it's the choose the actions on the paths which have the highest return overall, right? So it's not one step preview. Okay. It's saying that choose the things along the paths that are like the highest reward overall. But it is greedy in that it's like doing greedy ascent on your policy print. But it's not greedy with respect to action. So it's not like at every state choose the action that has the highest reward. You might have things that have zero reward for a long time, as long as the sum of rewards is the highest. Uh, you said it was only use the latest data, right? But use the latest batch of data, so as in the data from the latest policy. Like from your latest data. Like mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, exactly. But from the same policy, yeah. not from previous policies. Data box. Yeah. Um, earlier, uh, when you computed the gradient of J, so mm -hmm. we just had one single summation, and then we introduced the summation with the reward. Where? Um, Should I go back? Yeah. 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 Okay. Here? Yeah. The gradient here, the only summation with respect, we just have one single summation. Yes. And then we started multiplying the. Right. So if you look at the the expression here, right, it's the grad log speed at tau times. R tau, which is like the, the sum of rewards in the trajectory. Right. Right. So the, the way that this comes is there's one summation that's coming from the B theta, grad log B theta tau curve. Mm -hmm. And then there's another summation which is coming from your sum of rewards. Right. Yeah, this notation is a little confusing. The sum should be inside that. Okay, cool. Seems like we have some understanding of this. So let's keep going. Yeah. Okay. So how is this? We covered this, but how is this related to supervised learning? It's basically just pre weighted supervised learning. So you can look at the expressions, they look super similar. It's just that you're re weighting things according to your rule. Right. And the way you implement it, you'd implement it with cross entropy loss or max likelihood. You'd, you'd, you'd implement it looking very similar to supervised learning, just weighted supervised learning. Right? And something where you keep iterating your data collection. Okay. So why is this not just trivial? Why doesn't this solve all our problems? Well, the trouble here is that you have a very high variance estimate. So what I mean by that? What I mean is that you've sampled a single trajectory, right? And then you've said, okay, we're gonna upweight and downweight actions according to the sum of rewards of the trajectory. But the, the actions at every step are coupled with all the other actions in the trajectory, right? So you might have some things that were good, some things that were bad. And so things that were bad might also be pushed up. Things that were good might be pushed down. And so it's a high variance estimator. And additionally, you usually just have a single sample estimate, right? So um, what you say is that you just take the sum of the words in the single trajectory, right? In the trajectory that you experienced. But what you really want is something that looks more like the average sum of rewards from that state when you take that action, right? So you want to upweight things by the average goodness of an action at a state, not just by the one chance um, trajectory that you encountered, right? So you don't want to just see, yeah, like was good by mistake, I'm going to upweight things. Um, instead, you want to try and have a more average return estimate in the future, and that's going to lower your variance, right? So the trouble with most of these policy gradient estimators is that in order to get this estimate to be even reasonable, you need a shift down of samples, right? And so uh, some of the readings that we'll discuss next time basically talk about how most policy grid estimators are horrible estimates of the grid. And just because you need a lot of samples and uh, it doesn't fail well with horizon and uh, environment complexity and so on. Okay. So that's why this estimator doesn't just solve all our problems. Does that make sense? Okay. So, okay. So, there's some ideas we can use for reducing variance, right? The first idea is just to notice that um, trajectory returns only depend, like when you take an action at some state, it can't affect the re return or rewards in the past. It only really affects the rewards in the future, right? So if you look at our estimator right now, you're upweighting and downweighting API and SDI according to the rewards along the whole trajectory, right? But ATI and SDI cannot affect AT minus one or SD or R of ST minus one, AT minus one, right? That can't really affect the class. And so this sum includes T prime, which is less than T, when it really doesn't have to, right? And so you can 
ignore terms in the past and you can only focus on terms on in the future or in the present and the future. Right? So you can also show that this integrates out to zero. But um, what you can show here is that instead of including all the terms from zero to t, so the return of the whole trajectory, right? You can just include terms from your current time step to the end of the trajectory, right? So that's what you'll call the turn to go, right? They're just gonna say, let's uh, measure things from the current time step onwards. And I haven't put in discount and stuff here, but um, you can do that. And so the first idea is just use causality and say that actions can't affect the past, so ignore things that are in the past. Right? And that reduces variance because you're no longer coupling, you're going up and down to things in the past. So if you had things that were spuriously high in the past, they no longer affect your gradient estimate. Right? So you've lowered variance. So, yeah. Is this related to the Markov property? Like yes, okay. yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. So if it is a bomb DP, this would work. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's one way we can reduce variance, right? The second way we can reduce variance, let's you know take a little graphical example. I stole this from Sergey. Um, but um let's consider different trajectories, right? Uh plotted on this axis, right? The, their likelihoods are plotted with that the, the curve, right? And the rewards are plotted by the height of the line. Right? And so let's say we sample some trajectories, right? Two of them had a um, little bit positive return, and one of them had big negative return, right? So when you did a policy gradient update on this, what would happen is that you would try to push down things on the left a lot, and then you try to push up things on the right a little bit, right? So you would try to move your gradient estimator to increase the likelihood on those trajectories that are a little bit positive and really push down the likelihood on this trajectory that's over here and it's negative, right? Yeah. But now let's say we added a positive um, constant to all the rewards, right? And so what will happen is let's say now we sampled, you just added a positive constant to all of these rewards, right? So the the estimate should remain unchanged because it's you're doing an optimization where you've set a constant, right? But now what's going to happen is that you're going to have all three of them being positive, right? It's just that one of them is a little less positive than the other, or one of them is a little less positive than the other, right? And when you look at what the gradient estimate looks like, it's going to look like something like this, right? And so what's going to happen is, depending on the scaling of the rewards, you will have the reward estimator giving you different gradients, right? So maybe at different states, uh, you might have uh, different gradients this way, and so it's going to give you high variance, right? And so instead, what we want to do is we want to just try and center the rewards as much as possible, right? So we don't have this arbitrary scale. We want to bring all the returns back down to being zero centered or <laughs> approximately zero centered. Um, and then it pushes up some stuff and pushes down some stuff, but you don't have this huge variance that's going to come by arbitrary scaling in different states, right? And so that's the idea behind um, using a baseline, right? So what a baseline is going to be is that we're going to say, instead of just doing grad log phi times the sum of rewards in the future, we're also going to subtract a baseline, which is a function of ST. We're going to have some, some function of V of ST, We'll discuss what it is, but um, what that does is it tries to center the returns in a way that reduces variance, right? And so we're gonna still say try to maximize likelihood of things that are high reward, but just minus the averaging term, the baseline. And so it's gonna like push up some stuff, push down some stuff, and have lower variance. Right? And we'll discuss why it has lower variance, but this is what you'd call a baseline. So anytime in so some of the papers are about. Um, baseline, anytime you see a baseline, it's referring to this term that you use to subtract from the return. Right? Did I lose everyone? Or are we good? If anyone has a question, just ask me now, because otherwise you'll get lost. Okay. Now, it seems kind of weird that I just stuck in a baseline term. Um, it's not clear if it's the same gradient, it's not clear if it's unbiased, right? How could I just stick a thing? And so what we'll do next is we'll show that this doesn't actually change the bias of the, it's the, the estimator remains unbiased, but it reduces variance, right? So if we look at our policy gradient estimator, right? 
you're going to have some likelihood of states and actions times your grad log pi times your sum of rewards in the future minus your baseline. All we want to show is that this gradient is the same as if you didn't have the baseline, right? And then it remains unbiased in expectation, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to just separate out these two terms. First term is just going to be only the sum of rewards in the future. And the second term is going to be multiplying with the baseline, right? And what we need to show is that this second term is zero, and then we're golden, right? Because if the second term is zero in expectation, these two estimators give you the same thing. Yes? Okay. So let's try and work through that, right? So if you look at your expectation here, right, we can, that's the marginal of the states in action. So you can break up into the marginal of the states times the likelihood of your action AT at state ST under your policy, right? So you can take a marginal and break it up into P of ST times phi theta AT given ST, um, and everything else remains the same, right? And now what you can say is that the integral, one of them is with respect to ST, one of them is with regard to AT, right? So anything that does not depend on AT, you just move out of the first integral, right? So you just move B of ST, B of ST, B of ST doesn't depend on the action, right? So you just moved it up, right? And now you have pi theta, grad theta, log pi theta, um, times D of AT, right? Now what you can do is you can flip the thing that we did last time, right? So we multiplied and divided by P theta. We did all this manipulation to get the grad log pi. And now we can just notice that grad log pi is nothing but grad theta p theta divided by p theta, right? And then the p theta cancel, and then you just end up with this thing, right? You just reverse the reinforced trick. Make sense? Okay. And so if you reverse the reinforced trick, then you take the gradient out of the integral, right? Um, and then you see that you have the integral of pi theta at given st d at. But what is phi theta? What is this integral? Right? That's one, right? Yeah. Nice. So if it's one, then you have the gradient with respect to theta of one, which is just zero. And so this whole term becomes zero. Right. And so we can show that whenever you add a baseline, it leaves your estimator unbiased um, by just reversing the reinforced trick. Right. Um, and then you show that this whole estimator remains the same. And so you can subtract this baseline, reduce the area, and get the fix. Yeah. Any questions? No? Okay. So that's good. Um, yes. Can you get a one more time? Yes. We don't prove that uh, ignoring the first t minus one terms in the yes. The, I, I didn't prove that here. That's a separate proof. Yeah, because we don't know if that's still if that if this gradient is still unbiased. Uh, yeah, I guess that's a separate proof, and you can prove that that integral is also zero. Okay. Uh, but this proof is just for the B term, assuming okay, that other proof. Why do we need an unbiased gradient here? We're not using stochastic. We're using the gradient over the full batch, right? and. But even if it's a gradient of the full batch, you still need it to be unbiased, otherwise it's sent send you somewhere else. It's just like the wrong gradient. Like what does unbiased mean, right? In expectation, the gradient is pointing in the right direction. So if it's biased, it's sending you somewhere else, right? And biased gradients are okay sometimes, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think in my head, uh, and by unbiased, I meant, I meant the gradient of a mini badge is the expected gradient of the mini badge is in the Gradient of the full batch. No, by unbiased, we mean when you take the estimator and you take its expectation with like a huge number of samples, mm -hmm. it gives you the, the, the true gradient. And so the expectation of the estimator is the same as the true gradient. Okay. okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so we worked out that this thing's unbiased, right? So a natural question to ask is what is the what is the optimal baseline? Right. Um, so, like, what what should we choose the baseline to be? Because I, all I've said here is that baseline is some function of st, 
And we haven't really talked about what the baseline should be. Right? So maybe we should figure out what the optimal baseline is. Right? Um, so I'll try something different. I'm gonna try sketching on this iPad. May or may not work. But um, just so the people on Zoom, et cetera, can see. Right? But we'll try and work out what the optimal baseline kind of looks like. Right? And when I say optimal baseline, the goal is to reduce variance. Right? So what we want to say is that eh, variance of your estimator. Right? Can you guys see this on Zoom? Yep. Yes? Yeah. It's like slightly laggy, but it's, okay. it's fine. Um, it. Cool. So the variance of your estimator, right, which is um right is somehow minimized right and so what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and pick a b which is going to minimize your variance right so i'm not going to i'm going to shorthand things and be a little sloppy with notation but i'll just convey the key idea right and so what we're going to try and do is we're going to show that if you take the expectation of grad log b theta tau times r tau minus b the whole square minus the expectation of grad theta of b theta tau r tau minus b whole square here. Ah, I went a little off, but is this readable? Kind of. Um, so this is just the expectation of x square term, and this is an expectation of x the whole square term, right? What we're going to try and do is just pick a b that minimizes this, right? We're going to just do min with respect to b. Yeah? OK. And now if you look at the second term, we just showed that this is unbiased, right? So you can show that this, you can get rid of the b from here, right? And then the first term, um, what we can do is we can just take the gradient with respect to b. So we can expand this as expectation of grad log b theta tau squared times r tau squared plus b squared minus 2 r tau b, right? Just standard. And then all you want to do is take the gradient respect to b squared to zero, right? And so just you realize that this term doesn't matter, right? And so if you simplify this a little bit, yes? OK, so this term doesn't matter. This term matters. This term matters, right? And so what we can write this out as is expectation with respect to the trajectory of grad log b e theta tau the whole squared times 2b minus 2 expectation of grad log p theta tau the whole square times r is equal to zero. Yes? Here you just, this b goes away, this becomes a 2b, right? And then we're good. And this term doesn't matter, right? So now we just equate this to zero. We, um, sorry, we remove the two terms, right? And what we should be able to get here is that b is equal to expectation grad theta log e theta tau the whole square times r divided by expectation grad theta log b theta tau the whole square right and so this is your expression for your optimal baseline right so let's just redo the steps so that we all follow, right? We started by defining the variance of your estimator, right? There's just standard definition of variance. Then we said, okay, our estimator is grad, grad theta log p theta tau times r tau minus p. So we stuck that into our definition of variance, right? Um, and then we said, okay, the second term doesn't depend on b. You can get rid of that. The first term, we then took the gradient with respect to b and equated it to zero, right? And then we said, okay, we can split up r tau minus b into the whole square into three terms. First term doesn't matter. The second term becomes 2b. And the third term just becomes r tau or 2r tau, right? And then we just equate to 0, move things around a little bit. And then you get the expression for your optimal baseline. 
right? Does that make sense? I think someone's at the door. Maybe not. Okay. Does everyone follow this? Right? Now, note that this is not, this is a single baseline for everything, right? So this is not a optimal state dependent baseline. This is just a single constant baseline that you would use, right? Um, and yeah, so if you can compute this, you should use this, um, but you can potentially do better by having your uh, baseline depend on the state, right? Everyone follows? I'll make this nicer and share it on the slides so everyone can go over it again, right? But does this generally make sense? Okay, so here it is. Everyone on Zoom followed? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear? Can you hear us? And here, one sec. Oh, wait, that's a question. Rosario, do you say? Oh. something? Yeah, yeah. I just was wondering if you could hear us if we said anything. <laughs> ah, yeah. Um, I, I couldn't hear you, but now I hear you. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was going to ask about state. So that sounds like what you're going to talk about now. Yes, yes, right. yes, yes. So, so this is uh, assuming that the B is a constant, uh, but you, if you have a state-dependent baseline, you could do better. Yes. Ah, there we go. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we talked about the optimal baseline, but typically we don't actually go through the, when in practice, when you do this, you don't actually go through the process of constructing the optimal baseline. What you do is something really simple. You say, um, what we're going to try and do is we're just going to try and learn this approximate value function v hat, right? And we're going to try and regress it onto the sum of rewards in the future, right? So we're just going to say, let's try and learn um, our baseline as v hat, which is just the average sum of rewards in the future, right? We're just going to use standard Monte Carlo regression in order to um, learn your value function v hat. Um, it's not quite the optimal baseline, but it works really well in practice, right? So what most people do is they just have an additional value function. They just add a loss that says, uh, try to predict the average sum of rewards um, from a particular state in action by just doing Monte Carlo regression. Right? So you're just regressing on the sum of rewards. And then you're just going to take your standard estimator from D prime to uh, D prime from D to D and just subtract your approximate value function we have, right? And so what, that's what most people do in practice. Not perfect, but um, this seems to work really well. Okay. So um, that, that's to Rosario's question about state. This is a state-dependent entity. Uh, there's a typo here that is ST, right? Um, but um, yeah, that's what you do in practice. Cool. All right, so the first part of the lecture that we covered so far, we talked about vanilla policy again. We derived it from gradient descent. It's a little bit different than supervised learning, but we did the reinforced trick. We said that this is high variance. And then we talked about two methods for variance reduction. The first is um, ignoring things in the past. And the second is subtracting the baseline. Right? Um, so that's the first part of the lecture. OK, should we continue? Yes? Ready. So we have like 50 minutes. Wait. So uh, if you look at the policy gradient, right? Um, it's just doing gradient descent, right? That should be a set. But um, what it's just doing is it's steepest descent on some linear approximation of your cost function, right? Under a quadratic um, constraint on your parameter, right? So you can show that gradient descent is um, the solution to the optimization problem, right? So when you take the gradient, it's the optimum value of this uh, this problem, this 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 optimization problem, right? So you're taking um, the first order Taylor approximation to your objective, and you're considering um, a quadratic constraint or including constraint on your um, on your state test, right? And so the solution the solution to this thing, if you just um, write out the Lagrange uh, Lagrange dual and you solve it, will give you gradient set essentially. Right? And so this is what we're typically doing in the section that we've done thus far, just expressed slightly differently, right? Um, this gives us our gradient descent objective. Right? Now, what might be problematic here is that one is if you choose your step sizes wrong, right, you might go too far, and this could be really bad. And so in practice, what might happen is when you choose the step sizes to be really big in policy grid, you start collecting, you, you take a wrong step, you start collecting really bad data. And then you just get completely horrible and you never recover. Right. So often when you use policy grid, you have to 
usually tiny step sizes, right? And so that makes it super slow. And the second is that it's super sensitive to the policy parameters issue, right? So ideally, if you reparameterize your policy, you shouldn't change your update that much if it's functionally similar. You scale some weights by a lot, you reduce other weights by a little bit, it shouldn't screw everything up. Um, but policy again is super sensitive to the parameterization of the policy. Um, and this makes it hard to use for deep neural nets and so on. Um, not just, but especially for right? And so we'll, in this next section, we'll try to correct some of these issues. Right? Is she also sensitive to the initialization? Yes, yes. That's true for most things. Um, and I guess in practice, what we find is that it is somewhat sensitive to the initialization, um, but there are schemes that work reasonably well on lots of problems. Um, one of the readings I assigned this week talks about the effect of initialization. Right. So let's think about this sensitivity to policy parameterization a little bit, right? So let's say we had our, some loss function, which is dependent on these two policy parameters, theta one, theta two. You take the gradient, both of them, it's just one, right? But then you like reparameterize it. So you say you, we have pi one and pi two, which are now theta one square. Uh, one over theta two, and your loss function, which is equivalent in terms of those parameters, is now um, you know pi one to the zero point five plus pi two inverse, right? Uh, but if you look at the gradient with respect to these different parameters, right, the gradient looks super different. Right? It's super dependent on what the values of theta one, theta two are, and so you just by a simple reparameterization, you just like totally change the gradient, right? And so. Um, just by by doing this kind of thing, this is what you call not covariant, I guess. Um, but the the update is super sensitive to some parameters being bigger or smaller than the others. Right? And so that's that. So let's try and fix that, right? So the issue is you'll see behavior like this, right? Depending on some parameters being bigger than others, you start seeing behavior like this. And instead you want to like reparameterize things so that the behavior looks more like this, right? You want to go really quickly to the code um, and not be sensitive to different policy positions. And so what we're going to try and do is rather than um, uh, solve our optimization problem under the quadratic metric, right? the problem with the quadratic metric is it weights every dimension of the theta equally. Right? If you look at the quadratic metric, theta minus theta i transpose and theta minus theta i, right? it weights every dimension equally. And what we're going to try and do is we're going to introduce some g, which reweights the, um, which reweights the dimensions so that it looks somewhat more like this, and it's less sensitive to this policy parameterization, right? And so we're going to try and figure out what the g should be. Um, and once you have the g, you can just work out the Lagrange dual again, and you will see that the update looks something like this. It's like scaled by the inverse g. Right? So let's assume that we knew the g. We'll talk about what the g should be in a second. But if you had a G like this, and you work out the uh, gradient update, you'll see that the gradient update looks something like this, where the gradient um, is now scaled by the G inverse. And if you chose the G inverse properly, then you shouldn't be as sensitive to policy parameterization because the G inverse can um, renormalize for some parameters being bigger or smaller than the others. Right? Does that make sense as a conceptual framework? And we'll get to the detail. So what we want to do is figure out what G should be so that it's less sensitive to the policy parameterization, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to try and say, OK, what makes things less sensitive to the policy parameterization is that we, instead of trying to measure distance in parameter space, we mention measure distance in functional space, right? So we say the thetas parameterize some policy distribution by theta, right? And then we try to measure the divergence between the policy distributions and say that those should move that much, right? So rather than trying to measure divergence in um, in theta space, we try to measure divergence in probability distribution space, right? And so everyone knows what a KL divergence is, yes? No? Okay, so a KL divergence is, is a divergence metric between phi theta i and phi theta, um, which is defined as the Expectation by theta i. Let's see if I can write it down. Um, one sec. Okay. Um, my iPad is not working, but it's the 
the expectation by theta i log by theta i and so just saying that if phi theta and phi theta phi theta and phi theta or theta and theta were the same then that thing would be zero right but it tries to measure the difference between those two distributions phi theta and phi theta right and so what we're going to try and do is try to um use that constraint rather than the quadratic constraint right uh, specifically, what we're going to try and do is we're going to use a second order approximation of your TL divergence, right? So we're going to say, let's take the um, the second order Taylor approximation of your TL divergence, and let's use that in order to figure out our G, right? And so that's still going to be a quadratic function of theta. It's just going to have, we're just going to be able to figure out the G. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? So all we said is, okay, we started from the the quadrat linear approximation to the objective, quadratic approximation to the constraint, right? And then we said, okay, we're going to rescale it with G. And we said, okay, uh, the thing we want to do is we want to me measure functional distance. So we're going to use the KL divergence and we're going to use the second order Taylor approximation of the KL divergence. Yes. Okay. Can you go to the slide, sir? Yes. Yeah. Uh, if we use the Hessian for G, Hessian of mm -hmm. J, uh, isn't that like almost similar to the constant? Yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be that. Or I am as well. Right. Answer. Yeah. So, but in in those uh, formulations, we don't we don't use the k We just uh, approximately compute the Hessian. So the Hessian of. That's what I added right in my Uh, so you're saying use a second order method for J. Uh. So you're saying replace G with the Hessian? With the Hessian? Yeah, but since Hessian is uh, computationally expensive, we just uh, compute the diagonal elements of the Hessian? Right. Right. So the Hess what we're going to use is the Hessian of the KL divergence, which is a little bit different than what you're saying. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you're suggesting take the Hessian of the J. Uh, of the J. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's a little bit different. That was like the Hessian of the parameters. And we were doing like the talk with the Hessian of the like policies. I guess he's saying take the Hessian of the expected loss. Use a Newton yeah. method here. I guess what we're what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use the use the Hessian of the algorithm. But uh why is this technique better? Because that works pretty well for uneven loss landscapes. Um I guess this like this this a lot, this makes it work for different parameterizations because it's measuring functional distance thing. So it's it's like it is a probability distribution, it's rescaling it according to how it affects the probability. Well, I thought what you were suggesting was to take the question and then directly optimize the J. Right. Which I think would be pretty expensive for well, depending on how the top would be but now we're uh, taking actually one step back saying that we might not be able to use a Haitian and that's why we're doing the gradient descent and we want to limit the step size and we couldn't even limit the step size uh, like the first formula on the slides so alternatively we're proposing the KL divergence to limit the step size even and yeah. I, I guess he's saying that the Hessian, Hessian can be approximately like kind of does that is what he's saying yeah I mean Hessian does the same and Instead of computing the whole Hessian, we can just compute the diagonal elements. So that's why it's still uh, linear then. Of yeah, that. fair enough. Um, let's discuss this after class. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay, so um, how much time do we have? Okay, maybe let's skip this. But believe me, when uh, we say that the second order approximation of the uh, the KL divergence is gonna give your G function as this uh, Fisher information metric, right? Which is um, the outer product of grad log phi times grad log phi transpose, right? Taken under your uh, policy by theta, right? And so when you rewrite, um, when you rewrite your um, D, you just substitute in this Fisher information metric as your G or F here, right? And so what you're going to rescale with is not quite the Hessian of your loss. It's the Hessian of your KL divergence, which looks like this um, 
uh, this like auto product between Gradle and Gradle Cloud, right? So this is what you're gonna call a natural policy gradient update, right? And in your natural policy gradient, you're gonna um, rescale um, things by the inverse of your official information metric, right? So this thing is gonna be uh, dimension parameters by parameters. So it's like a huge thing. That's in a neural net, it's gonna be a ginormous thing. But you're going to try and take that, you're going to invert it, and your update is going to be um, scaled by the inverse of the fish information metric. Okay. And uh, the, step, the step that I skipped is to just uh, take the second order Taylor approximation of the KL divergence and show that that is um, equal to the fish information metric times delta Taylor transpose. Right. Okay. okay. So this is going to be the natural policy gradient. The idea is just uh, we're going to deal with sensitivity to policy parameterization by using a KL divergence instead of a quadratic constraint on the theta. Um, we're going to use a second order approximation of the KL divergence that's going to give the Fisher information metric. And we're just going to have an update which is rescaled by the inverse of the Fisher information metric. Right. Um, right. So that's the natural policy gradient. Um, any questions? Yeah. When people actually use this, like, do it actually work much better than the vanilla policy gradient? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, significantly better than the vanilla policy gradient. People came back to something that looks more like the vanilla policy gradient than the PPO did, but I will work as there. But, but just the vanilla policy gradient just doesn't work for, um, it's in the homeworks that I put out, but it, it basically doesn't work with any harder problems than Carpool. But this one works on stuff, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, people usually use small policies and we'll in the next section we'll talk about some approximations that make it more tractable to use on bigger models. Does it work if you have like a bigger space model and then any some like yeah, you could do that. Uh, I don't know if people actually do that. Um, I haven't seen anyone do that. But generally, I haven't seen that many people use natural policy gradient on deep models as is. They use like approximations to make it more tracked. Yeah. Any other questions before we move on? Cool. All right. So. As we just talked about, the natural policy gradient is going to struggle when you have like a huge model because your fish information matrix is, uh, or fish information metric is huge, right? So inverting it is going to be a uh, pain, right? Um, and the second thing is we still haven't figured out how to set the step size, right? So you can still have step size that is too big and it could yeah, do horrible things, right? So there's still two issues with natural policy gradient which make it hard to use with deep models, right? And so um, what we're going to try and do is the next paper we're going to cover is stress fusion policy optimization, uh, which was introduced in 2015 or so. And it has two key ideas in my mind. Right? There's different ways of interpreting it. But uh, for the sake of exposition, I think there's two key ideas to take away here. The first one is um, instead of trying to do a huge matrix inversion, right? we're going to use the conjugate gradient method. Um, convert into a minimization problem and so prevent this huge inversion. And then the second is uh, to deal with the step size, we're just going to use backtracking line search to decide what the step size should be. Right? And then there's a few other things that they do here and there, but I think those are the two important bits for a practical implementation. Right? And it gets you pretty nice results, like these are the video that I like where uh, John is showing that you can get a uh, humanoid to learn walking in just a few hours of training. And so, um, at least when it came out, it was quite a shocker. Um, cool. And so, there's a bunch of these fun videos you should check out. Um, cool. So, all right. So, the issue here is that it's challenging to compute F inverse and then do F inverse G, right? Um, so, what we're going to do is we're going to convert it into some sort of minimization problem, which we can solve with some iterative method, which is easier than trying to invert. Um, F, right? So we're going to say that the solution to Fx equal to G, right, which is just F inverse G, is the same as the solution to some uh, quadratic uh, problem that looks like this, right? So you just um, 
do the state again with respect to x and set it to zero, and you'll see that these are the same, right? And so what we're going to try and do in this conjugate gradient method is we're going to try and solve this optimization rather than trying to do a big inversion there. And we're going to use an efficient method to solve this optimization, right? Can we just do maybe this method? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's what we're going to do. Variation. Variation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So we're saying that we're going to solve it with conjugate gradient, but you could solve it with gradient descent. Now, gradient descent is just less efficient of a method, um, right? So conjugate gradient descent will have steps that look like that, right? And conjugate gradient will just be quicker, right? And so I'm not going to cover the details of conjugate gradient today. Um, you should take a good optimization class. Um, but the rough idea is that gradient, de gradient descent doesn't have to go along the orthogonal direction, right? So in conjugate gradient, we're going to try and find orthogonal directions or f orthogonal directions and we're going to try and move in big orthogonal directions so the number of steps you need to convergence are smaller right and so what we're going to say is that gradient descent might every time you do something you might undo some of the work you did last time right uh, whereas with conjugate gradient you're going to try and explicitly find orthogonal directions or f orthogonal directions which by f orthogonal directions i'm going to say that the directions that you want are orthogonal when multiplied that F matrix, right? Um, it should be di plus one and di are orthogonal when you multiply it with an F matrix, right? So if you step with di at one step, the next step, di plus one, should be F orthogonal to di, right? And if you can construct these directions efficiently, then you can converge in um, you know, approximately dimension number of steps, right? So um, the thought is that we've taken this inversion problem, we've converted an optimization problem, and then we're going to use an efficient optimization method to solve it um, in the cases when f is sparse. Right? And so um, all the all the conjugate gradient method uh, does is it just uh, does this conversion, solves it efficiently, and so we can deal with much bigger models than if we had to invert the whole uh, d by d matrix. Okay. So that's the first idea in TRPO. And the second idea is just backtracking line search, which is super easy, but it's just saying that if you're trying to, uh, once you've found a search direction with conjugate gradient, right? So you've said, okay, I'm gonna move in F inverse G, then you need to pick a step size. So all you're gonna do is you're gonna start with a large step size that you pick. So you're gonna pick the biggest step size such that the KL divergence constraint is satisfied. And then you're just gonna backtrack on that same direction. So you're going to keep reducing, you're going to choose a beta less than one and keep reducing your step size until your objective increases. Right? So all you're saying is that, okay, I start with some huge over approximation to my step size, and then I keep going back until my objective increases. And right? so that's all that backtracking line there. And right? so the key ideas in TRPO are um, you do conjugate gradient, you invert the F, and then you do backtracking line search, just choose the step size, right? Now there's, I guess, another idea um, that is a little bit more involved to explain, but um, the original objective that we have is um, state sample from P theta, action sample from pi theta A, right? But you're, if you're doing your optimization with respect to theta, then you don't necessarily have samples from this expectation, right? Because theta might be changing all the time. So you want to try and write out this expectation in terms of theta i, which is your previous distribution, previous policy parameterization for which you do have samples, right? And so what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and use important sampling in order to rewrite this expectation in terms of something that you can actually compute, right? So we're going to say, okay, there's an expectation with respect to p theta, action with respect to pi theta, right? And what important sampling is going to do is it's going to say, okay, we can change the action distribution to pi theta i, as long as we multiply and divide by pi theta divided by pi, or we multiply by pi theta divided by pi theta i, right? Uh, you can just move the expectation inside and you can see that um, important sampling just works here, right? So this equality holds with just important sampling, right? So we're just saying, we're still sampling states under p theta, but actions are sampled under p theta i, or pi theta i, right? Pi theta i is your, um, theta at your previous distribution, right? And then what you're going to say is, okay, 
I still can't sample states from B theta. So let me try and say that I'm going to sample states from B theta I. Right? So I'm going to sample states from my previous marginal over states. I'm going to sample actions from my previous um, policy. And then I'm going to use important sampling by theta by by theta I to correct for it. Right? Now, this is a little bit weird because you haven't corrected for the change in state distribution, right? Because that's horrible to approximate. Um, but we're going to show that, or the paper shows that it's not so bad. <laughs> um, so if phi theta and phi theta i are not super different, then this approximation of saying we're going to sample from p theta i is not that much worse than sampling from p theta. Right? Yes. And this because the uh, constraint on the diverse. Yes. Yes, also. exactly. Exactly. Right. So you put a constraint on how different phi theta and phi theta i are, and so their state marginals are also not that different, right? Or you found how much they're different, right? And so um, the last piece of DRPO is that instead of using an objective which is hard to compute because it's in terms of theta, they do important sampling to write it in terms of an objective that's easy to compute in terms of theta i, which is the policy that you've seen, or the thing that you have samples from, right? And so the three important bits are that you, you conjugate gradient, you do backtracking line search, and then you construct your objective with important sample. Okay. So yeah, those are three bits behind TRPO. This is the pseudocode. Um, paper is fairly accessible, so you, you should read it. Um, but the reason it's better than national policy grant in practice is just that um, it's a lot easier to deal with large models. It performs better in terms of not overstepping and getting stuck. Um, and yeah, so it you can see that it has a lot better performance. We have developed an algorithm called trust region policy optimism. Um, a lot better performance on a bunch of different simulated tasks. So they had, you know, Hopper, Swimmer, Walker, like lots of other simulated agents um, going up to pretty high dimensions that they all trained with the same algorithm, um, which worked a lot better than um, even national policy grid. I think people have done more code tricks make national policy again more performance now, but um, DRPO is a little bit easier to deal with, right? Well, why is it called trust region? Oh, because um, because when you constrain the KL divergence, but that that's like all a trust region. Right, but it's like doing op policy optimization with the trust region. <laughs> right, so yeah, I think that's all we got. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, but yeah. Um, I'll skip this for the sake of time, but you can say some reasonable things about it theoretically. Um, the practice kind of deviates from this, but you can say that you know the policies um, monotonically get better as long as they're close enough. Right? Okay, so um, there's still some issues with TRPO, right? And I'll really quickly cover them. The first is that the advantage estimation, we haven't talked about it yet, it's still doing sum of rewards minus the value function. So that still might be too high variance. And the second is that the conjugate gradient method can still be kind of finicky and expensive. And so there's some other ways you can try and um, deal with this fish information metric inversion, right? Um, so let's let's try and think about better advantage estimation. Right? So the, the technique that they propose is called generalized advantage estimation, right? GAE. And the idea is that what is an advantage, right? So advantage is sum of rewards minus a value function, right? So we talked about, okay, we're gonna sum up our rewards, we're gonna subtract our value function, that's gonna give us our advantage. And whenever we're gonna do policy again, it's like summing up your rewards minus your baseline, your baseline is your value function, right? And so that's your advantage. That's the thing you're gonna optimize. So this is what all of the methods that we've talked about so far are used, right? Now, the high variance, because you're summing up all of those rewards at the start still. Right? Now that's the that's what you'd call the n step advantage estimate. Right? You can also consider um, different steps of advantage estimation. Right? So you can say that you have a one step advantage estimator, which is just saying you take reward at the first step plus gamma times the value function at the second step, and then you subtract the value function at the first step. Right? So it's saying that if your value function was a perfect estimator of your rewards to go, right? You can replace the sum of rewards, um, the first n rewards, with just gamma times your value function at the next step. 
Um, and so you don't have to sum up all of those rewards. You can just use your value estimator, right? And so that's a one-step estimator because you just use one reward. And that's an n-step estimator because you have to sum up n rewards. And then you can consider everything in between, right? So you sum up n minus one rewards, n minus two rewards, n minus four rewards, right? And so you can construct a bunch of different estimators of the advantage, right? And they're different because, um, you know, the top estimator is unbiased, right? It's just, as we showed earlier, it's unbiased. It's uh, Monte Carlo reward minus the value function. Um, it's unbiased as long as the value function is a function of state, right? So it gives you the right thing, but it's high variance. And the thing at the bottom is low variance, but it's biased, right? Because if your value function is wrong, then this advantage is just wrong, right? So you have a spectrum of things that are high variance, um, but unbiased and low variance, but biased, right? And so what they proposed here um, empirically was that what you can consider is a geometric sum of all of these different estimators, right? So you have some lambda parameter, which defines what your geometric sum is done with respect to. And then you say it's your advantage is actually you're gonna construct all of these estimators and you're gonna take some geometric sum of them, right? So you're gonna say, okay, we're gonna take lambda to the J and we're gonna sum up all of these different estimators, right? And that's going to give us something that interpolates between being high variance, unbiased, and high bias, low variance, right? So lambda equal to zero will be, um, I believe, high bias, and lambda equal to one will be high variance, right? And so by choosing what your lambda is, you can control this bias variance trade off for different problems. Um, you can choose particular lambda, this like a hyperparameter that you optimize. Yes. If we want to do um, online learning, we mm -hmm. want to use the things that uh, As in, if your data is coming in streaming? Yeah, coming streaming. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, because you don't want to store all your graph data. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that uh, online. So if data keep coming, then as in, you want to do it as high, right? Yes. In, the, in this particular thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. They tried this empirically, and the thing to take away from this curve is that lambda equal to zero um, is not very good. Right? You want to minimize the cost. Lambda equal to zero is not very good. Uh, but lambda equal to one is not ideal either. Right? And so some lambda, which is in between, is what works best. Right? And so they found empirically, and, and most practical implementations use this, is that you choose some lambda in between in order to get some bias variance straight off. And you get nice results like that. Make sense? Can you go back one thing? Yes. Uh, is that capital D instead of N? I mean, that's R1, R2, L, R. Uh, that's, yes. Take the rewards yes, sure. along the that's trajectory. Cap. That's cap. Yeah, good catch. <laughs> yeah, so you sum it along the trajectory. Often the, um, you can do infinite horizon because you're using discounting. Okay. And uh, you just do a little bit of manipulation to get it into a amenable form. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Um, cool. So the, the next bit is that, how do we deal with this um, huge Fisher information matrix? Well, we said we'd use conjugate gradient, right? which is one way of doing things. Now uh, there's a somewhat different way of doing things, which is to use what you call Kronecker factorization, right? And so Kronecker factorization is a particular factorization of uh, a matrix, which allows you to invert it super easy, right? So what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna try and have two approximations in order to make inverting the Fisher information matrix easy, right? The first thing we're gonna try and do is we're gonna block diagonalize it, right? So we're only gonna, the Fisher information matrix is something which is parameter dimension by parameter dimension, right? We're only going to consider block diagonal things, so things which only consider um, outer products within the same layer. So if you flatten all the layers, right, you only want to consider things within the same layer. Uh, maybe I have a filter. So, right, yeah. So you want only want to consider this is your full Fisher information matrix, a matrix, right? So you're going to um, try and only consider things which correspond to corresponding layers. So you're going to block diagonal, diagonalize it, right? which is an approximation. 
And then the second thing you're going to try and do is you're going to say for each block diagonal, right? You're going to try and um, express it as the Kronecker product of two smaller matrices, right? And then you're going to use some special properties of the Kronecker product in order to invert it. Right? So the key idea, the, there's two key ideas. Uh, the first is we're going to try and block diagonalize the Fisher information metric. And the second is we're going to try and represent each block diagonal element um, with the Kronecker product, which makes it easy to invert. Right? Make sense? We'll get to the details. Okay. So what is the Kronecker product? Right? The Kronecker product is the generalization of the tensor product, which looks something like this. Right. So if you have A and B, which are M by N, A by B, right? the Kronecker product gives you an M A by N B matrix. Right. You can think of it as like you take every element of B and multiply it by an element, one element of A, then you dial it, right? And so it's it's not the same as the matrix product, right? But it's um, yeah, it's what you call the product product. And it has some nice properties, right? So these are just some identities of the product product, right? Um, most important is this one on the bottom, which says that the Kronecker product of or the inverse of uh, the Kronecker product of the things is the Kronecker product of the inverse, right? And the insight we're going to make is that um, you can take the Kronecker product of two smaller matrices to get a much bigger matrix. And so you can invert two much smaller matrices and then take the Kronecker product. So you don't have to invert a huge thing. Right? That's the key. That's the key insight. Right? So all we're going to do, as we said before, is we're going to block diagonalize things. We're going to represent everything as a Kronecker product. And that's going to make it easier to invert. Okay, does that make sense at the high level? Okay, so let's work through that very quickly. So let's assume we're, you know, a feed forward neural net. Right? So let's say your weights are W, um, your previous layer activations are A, right? Um, and S is your pre activations at the next layer, right? Um, so S will go through activations and then it'll give you the next layer. Right? So what you can do is by just using the chain rule, you can say the gradient of the loss function with respect to W is the gradient with respect to S times the gradient of S with respect to W, right? So you can just say that the gradient of L with respect to W is grad L with respect to S times grad S with respect to W, which is just A transpose, right? It's just simple chain rule. And then you can use some of the matrix identities that you had earlier, right? Specifically, uh, vector form of UV transpose is the Kronecker product, and the product of Kronecker products is just the Kronecker product of products, right? And so we can say that this is the Fisher information matrix, right? Uh, Fisher information matrix, which is just um, going to take um, grad L with respect to W. Um, L is going to be log pi or something, right? Um, and then you're going to say that's the same thing as grad S L A transpose, right? So the first term is going to be grad S L A transpose. The next term is going to be that thing transpose, right? And then you're going to notice that grad S L A transpose is nothing but the Kronecker product between grad S L and A by the first identity. Okay. Now, the good thing about this is that each of these matrices is much, much smaller. And right? so what are the dimensions of these matrices? Um, A is going to be the dimension of your previous layer, and grad S is going to be the dimension of your next layer. Right? So um, it's going to, if your weight matrix was M by N, your, your Fisher information matrix would be M, MN by MN. Right? But here you're computing now an M by M, M by M matrix and an N by N matrix, which are much, much smaller than an MN by MN matrix. Right? And so you've converted the super expensive inversion into two much smaller inversions, right? And so that makes things better. Um, and so that's that's the main idea behind this, this chronicle factorization. You're just gonna try and, um, you're gonna try and approximate things with the chronicle product in a way that makes it easy to invert, right? And so you have much, much smaller matrices. Um, and so that gives you something that's much more tractable. Um, okay, does that make sense? Sorry, we went on the board. Sorry, Zoom Zoomers. Um, but okay. And last thing we'll cover really quickly 
is the algorithm that works the best, <laughs> which is proximal policy optimization or PPO, right? Um, so what we did here was we did DRPO. We had this, you know, optimization with conjugate gradient, or something like that. Um, but instead, what you can try and do is try and control how much the policy moves directly, right? So what this constraint is trying to do is it's trying to constrain how much the policy moves, right? So you're saying theta and theta i shouldn't be that different. Um, but instead, what you might want to do is just say, okay, you're going to do important sampling for your update. We already talked about how we're doing that, right? What if we just um, the important sampling update says how different pi theta and pi theta i are, right? This ratio tells you how different they are. All you can do is you can just clip the difference. And so you say that, okay, you're going to have your loss function be the important sampling update, but you're going to clip it with at one minus epsilon, one plus epsilon, right? So if you choose epsilon to be zero, the policy cannot move, right? Theta has to be equal to theta i. If you choose epsilon to be small, the policy could move a little bit. And depending on the choice of epsilon, um, you can control how much the policy moves without having to go through all the expensive second order optimization and all the other stuff, right? And so um, what people do is they just construct this surrogate objective, which is just a clipped important sampling objective. And then they just use stochastic gradient to set them, right? So you just sample a bunch of data, you compute, yeah, compute the advantage and then compute this clipped objective. And then you just do stochastic gradient to set them, right? And the nice thing about this is that it's amenable to mini batch stochastic gradient descent. You don't have to compute the Fisher information metric and invert it. It's simple and it's stable. And I think people do a lot of tricks on it because you know how to, people have done a lot of tricks on SGD. And so it works really, really well in practice, right? And so it's a little ironic. We went through all of this complicated stuff and then we just do something kind of naive. <laughs> but this is what seems to work best in practice. And so, the videos I thought were cool are this is from some folks at NVIDIA doing cube rotation and um, general purpose in hand rotation and simulation. Um, they use the same algorithm for StarCraft and Dota. I don't think StarCraft, at least Dota, Dota 2. Um, and yeah, I think you can look at all of the policy gain methods in the last year, 90% of them will use PPO. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do research into other things. It just means I think people have figured out the tricks better for PPO. So there is a uh, key pointing me to this nice paper, which tries to study the differences between PPO and TRPO empirically. And what they found is that the like clipping update doesn't matter that much. What matters a lot is the, the tricks that people use. So for instance, they have tricks like normalizing the weights or scaling the advantages or clipping the gradients and um, there's like eight different tricks that they have in here. And if you compare PPO uh, versus TRPO plus the tricks or TRPO without the tricks and PPO without the tricks, um, they're very comparable across a bunch of different environments, right? So although the paper says things are much better, if you apply the same tricks everywhere, the answers are a little more murky. And so one question that I'd like someone here to answer is, which one should we use? Is it just coding tricks? Are there, uh, you know, reasons we should use one versus the other, theoretically or empirically? Or yeah, so it needs more investigation. So I'd recommend we investigate that. Um, yeah, let's stop here for today. We'll cover frontiers next time.